questions without notice, Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Oh, no. New South Wales is sadly facing another devastating COVID-19 outbreak as a result of an unvaccinated airport driver contracting, contracting COVID-19. Jane Halton, the Morrison government's hand-picked advisor, warned of this in her report last year and this morning said, and I quote, I actually drew people's attention when I debriefed them to this particular issue. I actually said this was a potential hole and people needed to be very, very aware that these people and their transport arrangements had to be a high priority. Why are the people of New South Wales now suffering for the Morrison government's failure to act on warnings and recommendations delivered eight months ago? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thanks, Senator Camilli, for the question, Mr. President. Um, the national hotel quarantine system is operating based on the decision of National Cabinet and the agreements of National Cabinet to manage hotel quarantine for Australia's, Australians returning to Australia. Mr President, uh, I am as concerned as Senator Keneally and anyone else in this chamber that the driver was not vaccinated, Mr President, but the responsibility for those frontline workers managing hotel quarantine are based with the states, based on the decisions of National Cabinet, Mr President. And as we heard from the Chief Medical Officer, uh, the recommendations of the Halton Review have been implemented across the states, and, and Ms Halton has made a number of recommendations and public comments urging states to ensure that their hotel quarantine systems are complying with those processes, Mr President. And Mr President, as the CMO indicated to us at estimates recently, the management of hotel quarantine and the national system for managing returning travellers is a standing agenda item at every AHPPC meeting, uh, which is attended by the chief health officers of each state. Uh, to ensure that they continue to implement all of the learnings that have occurred even since the Halton Review comments over the last 12 months, to ensure that the, ho the hotel quarantine system does perform at its, possible, its best possible way to ensure Australians remain safe from the virus. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. I do. In facing another COVID-19 outbreak, the New South Wales Liberal Premier Gladys Berejiklian has said, and I quote, until the vast majority of our population is vaccinated, these threats will be real and ongoing. When will the vast majority of the New South Wales population be vaccinated? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Mr. President, the objective of the government is that every Australian who wants to have a vaccine will have the opportunity to take one up by the end of this calendar year. So that includes all New South Wales residents. It includes everyone across the country, Mr President. We released yesterday the data, Mr President, to indicate the vaccine supply availability that will facilitate that. Each of the, uh, the vaccine types that will be available to Australians to access a vaccine by the end of this year, Mr. President. So we continue to work cooperatively with the states. Well, Mr. Mr. President, it is actually happening, Order. Mr. President. Uh, there were close to 140,000 Australians who took up a vaccine just yesterday, Mr. Order. President. Just yesterday, Order. close to 140,000 Australians took up a vaccine. Senator Over 1.1 million. Australians have taken up a vaccine in the Order, last 10 Senator days, Mr Colbeck, President. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Premier Berejiklian also said, and I quote, New South Wales has, a re has had a real sense of urgency in relation to the vaccine rollout. Given Mr Morrison has said that it's not a race, why has the Morrison government not shared Premier Berejiklian's real sense of urgency? Senator Colbeck. 
Mr. President, will I agree with uh, Premier Berejiklian with respect to her, the work that she's doing? And, and I congratulate the New South Wales government, Mr. President, in particular, for the magnificent job that they have done in managing COVID-19 uh, throughout the pandemic, Mr. President. It is clear from all of the evidence that we have that they have been the best at managing outbreaks and working their way through the challenges that we have all faced in uh, the period of the, co of the pandemic, Mr. President. So we are supporting every state and territory with the supply information that was provided to them through National Cabinet Order. on Monday, Mr. President, uh, and we will continue to do that. And as vaccine supply arrangements are confirmed, they will be firmed up and the supplies provided to the state so that we can continue to support Australians. Senator Bragg. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister please advise the Senate on how the Morrison government is supporting jobs and investment by delivering on our plan for economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Bragg for his question. Indeed, uh, a passionate advocate, Senator Bragg, for investment in our economy, for the strength of Australian business, and what uh, what we have been able to achieve in Australia, amongst the most uncertain and challenging of global times, is very much the envy of the world. Australia has managed to save lives and livelihoods like few other countries in the world. And indeed, for nations of our size, scale and standing, we stand head and shoulders above the rest of the world for the saving of lives of Australians through the management of this pandemic and through the saving of livelihoods through the management of this pandemic. It has been the largest economic shock to the world since the Great Depression, Mr President. But pleasingly, Australia is recovering strongly and creating more opportunities for Australians. Under our economic recovery plan, the Morrison government has committed a record $291 billion of support to the economy to protect the livelihoods of Australians, to keep businesses in business and Australians in jobs. Our plan, laid out in successive budgets last year and this year, creates jobs, guarantees essential services and builds a more resilient and secure Australia. Our plan is based on ensuring lower taxes create the opportunities for investment, investment by households and investment by Australian businesses, putting more money in the pockets of hard-working Australians, enhancing reward for effort, supporting household demand, creating investment incentives for business, which are leading to more investment more productivity, but most crucially, more jobs for Australians. And that is the number one dividend that we wish to see Order. and that we take pride Senator in. Ayres. More jobs for Australians at record Order. levels. Senator Bragg, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Uh, can the Minister please inform the Senate about recent economic data and reporting and what these figures demonstrate about the success of the government's plan in creating more jobs and supporting our economy? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, last week we saw unemployment fall for the seventh consecutive month to 5.1 per cent, smashing all market expectations in seeing unemployment fall to such a low level. 115,000 new jobs created in that month, around 85 per cent of which were full-time jobs. Now, it's not that long ago that the Leader of the Opposition and those opposite we're, call, we're suggesting that the economic roof of Australia would come crashing in at the end of JobKeeper. But since the end of that program, we've seen 84,000 jobs that have been added to Australia's economy. Since the peak of the pandemic, 987,000 jobs have been created, with employment now surpassing its pre-pandemic levels. The March quarter national accounts saw growth of 1.8 per cent. Again, beating market expectations. In fact, the last three quarters of economic growth have been the strongest in Order. more than 50 years. Senator Birmingham. Senator Bragg, a final supplementary question. Minister. Uh, finally, can the minister outline the importance of lower taxes, reducing red and green tape, and a technology-not-taxes approach to emissions reduction? 
in generating jobs and investment, Order. and are there any risks to Australia's continued economic recovery if these Order measures Order. Sorry, are Senator not— Bragg, please, please. I asked yesterday for silence during questions. I need to be able to hear the question. Please continue, Senator Bragg. And are there any risks to Australia's continued economic recovery if these measures are not— Senator Green. If these Senator measures Gallagher. are not implemented. Senator Birmingham. Well, thank you. Thanks, Mr. President. Indeed, our government has invested significantly in having lower taxes to help ensure households and businesses can drive the economic recovery of Australia. Because we know that a genuine economic recovery comes from Australian business. It comes from policies that support business to invest and to hire more, more people and more Australians. That's why our government has got a commitment to lower income taxes. And we can guarantee that we will deliver those lower income taxes now and into the future. Those on the other side won't make that same commitment to lower income taxes. We've delivered lower taxes for Australian businesses to encourage investment. Those on the other side have always stood against lower taxes when it comes to investment. And of course, Australians can be thankful that we won the last election and are implementing those lower tax policies, or else we would have seen the $387 billion of additional taxes those opposite had taken to the last election, implemented Order. at precisely the wrong time, time for Australia that would have jeopardised. Expired. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister of Health, Senator Colbeck. I refer to the documents tabled by Senator Colbeck yesterday entitled, and I quote, COVID vac vaccination allocation horizons. <laughs> Why is there no mention of the word target and what precisely is meant by the new term horizons? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, no one Order. The understand the term horizons. Mr. Mr. President, Order. The, the document that I tabled yesterday that was provided to the states uh, by uh, Lieutenant General Fruin on Monday was to provide to the states and territories an indication of the vaccine volumes that will be provided to them on a weekly basis between now and the end of this calendar year. That is the point of that. That is a terminology that is a part of that document, Mr. President. Uh, and, Mr. President, uh, it is about providing information to Order. the states and territories so that they can adequately and appropriately plan their requirements for people to vaccinate Australians as the am amounts of vaccine be uh, be begin to grow towards the end of the calendar year, Mr. President. This is about working with the states and assisting them with their planning in relation to the workforce they will need to roll out the vaccine so that Australians, as we have said on a number of occasions, have the opportunity to access a vaccine before the end of this year. The document, Mr President, provides information as to the amount of vaccines of various types that will be provided to the states. It provides information about the, the volumes of vaccines that will be provided to GPs and through those various pathways that Australians will be able to access to get a vaccine by the end of this year, Mr President. This is about Order. providing information to assist the states and territories and those that are working with the government on vaccinating Australians with the information they need for their logistical planning. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. How many aged care workers and disability workers have been fully vaccinated in New South Wales? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, in respect of the um, aged care residents, Mr. President, can I say to you that of the I think you asked me for both. Okay, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, so in, in, in respect of the, the residents of aged care in, Vic, in New South Wales, every, every aged care facility in New South Wales has had 
uh, a first dose visit. Order, and, Senator uh, Colbeck. I have Senator Gallagher on a point of order. Senator Gallagher. Point of order on um, direct relevance, uh, Mr. President. There was no preamble. It's a very direct question. And um, if the minister misheard, it was specifically relating to workers in aged and disability sector. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. I, I have ruled previously that when questions are very strictly worded and seek a statement fact, that the test of direct relevance is very strictly applied. Um, the question I had, and I've allowed you to remind the minister, did refer, I believe, to aged care and disability workers uh, uh, in New South Wales. So I'll ask Senator Colbeck to uh, turn to that very specific question. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, in respect of the vaccination of uh, residential aged care staff, um, there are 20,375 who have received their first dose and 11,000. 196 who have received their second dose, Mr. President, in New South Wales. In New South Wales, uh, Mr. President, uh, I, I don't Order. have with me, Mr. President, I don't have with me the data for um, for NDIS or disability workforce. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The Morrison government has broken its promise that all Australians would be vaccinated by October, that 4 million would be vaccinated by the end of March, that all 1A would be vaccinated by Easter and that 6 million Australians would be vaccinated by the 10th of May. Can the minister confirm a horizon is actually never reached, just like every <laughs> single vaccine target the Morrison government has set itself? Order. Order. I'll, I'll call Senator Colbeck when there's silence. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. It's at times like this you think that the opposition's ears might be painted on, Mr. President, because we have explained a number of times, Mr. President, uh, that as the rollout Order. of the vaccination process has occurred, Order. that as the rollout of the vaccination process has occurred, uh, we have had to change our order on my change the, the way the rollout is occurring Long. based on the circumstances that have occurred. It's all very well, Mr. President, for the opposition to repeat something that happened or was said in February and ignore everything that's happened between now and order. then, Mr. President. In fact, it's quite dishonest that they continue to do that, Mr. President. We order. have had to make some adjustments to the rollout as, a, as circumstances have changed, order. Mr. President. We've had to do that, and we, Mr. President, continue to work with the states and territories using the information that we provided Order. to them yesterday so that Australians can get access to a vaccine that what, those that want one can do that by the end Senator of this calendar Ayers. year. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, President. My question is to uh, Senator Hume, uh, acting on behalf of the Environment Minister. Senator, the Great Barrier Reef suffered its first mass coral bleaching in 1998, the first in recorded history. Even though our best climate models at the time predicted it wasn't possible to have back-to-back -back mass coral bleachings, they did occur in 2016 and 2017. We had a fourth mass coral bleaching in 2019-2020. The reef is believed to have lost half of its coral cover. Your own internal reports in 2019 downgraded the status of the reef from poor to very poor. Last year, UNESCO downgraded the status of the reefs to critical. Minister, do you agree the Great Barrier Reef is in danger? Good question. This minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Hume. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you very much, Senator, for your question. Order. The Morrison government is deeply committed to protecting the World Heritage listed Great Barrier Reef. Benchmarked against global standards, Australia's management of the reef is recognised as a leading example and is considered, and is considered by many to be the gold the standard handling. for large-scale mar marine handling. protected the area the management, answer. according to that same UNESCO report. The centrepiece of Australia's reef protection efforts is the Reef 2050 Plan, jointly developed with the Queensland Government. The plan is being delivered and it is achieving results. We have reduced pressures on the reef, built reef resilience and strengthened partnerships for the future. Australian and Queensland governments are now investing more than $3 billion from 2014-15 to 2023-24 to implement the Reef 2050 Plan. 
More than $2 billion of this is from the Australian government, which is an unprecedented investment. They are big numbers, but what does that mean at the ground level? It means that the custodian of the Lady Elliot Island, Peter Gash, can continue 20 years of work transforming order. a former Senator island Hume, mine. I have Senator Wish Wilson on a point of order. Point of order on relevance, President. I, I did state un indisputable facts, and I asked the minister if she believed personally, if she believed the reef was in danger. Okay, she hasn't Senator, answered, come Senator, anywhere near answering. Senator, it's the same response order. she gave to Senator, Senator Waters Wilson, earlier this week. Your seat. Senators will note that in the previous series of questions, I reminded senators that when questions are very strictly worded, the test of direct relevance can easily be strictly applied. This question contained a preamble, and I believe the minister is being directly relevant in stating facts that are relevant to assertions you made in your preamble, Senator Wish Wilson. You've reminded the minister of the last part of your question, but she is free to continue being directly relevant to parts of the question as well. Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr. President. And I will remind Senator Wish Wilson my first sentence was, in fact, that the Morrison government is deeply committed to protecting the World Heritage listed Great Barrier Reef and that we fully recognise that the Great Barrier Reef is indeed facing serious pressures from climate change and other impacts, which is why we are, de which is why we are delivering the 2050 plan, which is jointly developed with the Queensland government. The big numbers in that plan mean that the custodian of Lady Elliot Island, Peter Gash, can continue 20 years of work transforming a former island mine site into a world-famous uh, ecological sanctuary. It also means that a continued conservation work with sea turtles at uh, Mon Repos and Rain Island. It means that five control vessels are continuing to protect reef resilience by culling coral-eating crown of thorns starfish on critical reefs in the marine park. And it means that Order, world Senator leading Hume, time for the answer has expired. Senator Wish Wilson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Chair. UNESCO is an authoritative, science-led, evidence-based body. Order. Based on an evidence process. Sorry, Senator Wish Wilson, please. President, I, I, I Senator, don't think Order. the death of the Senator Wish Wilson, please resume your seat. I'm Order. That's it. Order. Seriously. I'm asking people, please resume your seat, Senator Wish Wilson. I was attempting to give you the silence you deserve to ask your question, and I was attempting to call those on my right to order. Heckling during questions is utterly disorderly. Order, Senator Wish Wilson, please. Se I'm going to ask the clock to be reset. I'm going to ask the clock to be reset and Senator Wish Wilson to commence his question, which she has every right to be heard in silence. Senator Wish Wilson. Minister. Do you agree with UNESCO's recommendation to the World Heritage Committee to downgrade the status of the Great Barrier Reef to in danger, World Heritage in danger? Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Senator Wish Wilson, as I said, the Morrison government is deeply committed to protecting the World Heritage listed Great Barrier Reef. And we fully recognise, we fully recognise that the Great Barrier Reef Listen. is facing significant pressures from climate change and from other impacts. Order. We do not. We do not support the recommendation to immediately place the reef on the list of world heritage in danger, and we will strongly oppose that recommendation. <laughs> Mr President, we think that this recommendation is premature and doesn't recognise the enormous efforts of the Australian and Queensland governments working with farmers, working with tourism operators, working with traditional owners and working with local communities up and down the reef coast to protect the reef and to support them with a $3 billion joint investment. This government has been stunned by the backflip on previous assurances by UN officials that the reef would not face such a recommendation prior to the UNESCO World Heritage Committee meeting Order. hosted by China this July. Senator Wish Wilson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, President. Uh, Dr Fanny Duver, the head of UNESCO's World Heritage Marine Program, has completely rebutted any backflip. Minister, what are you going to do about the barrier reef? Are you going to, as Dr Dever suggested, stand together with the international community rather than fight this and address the issue at hand, which is that without climate action there is no future for the Great Barrier Reef? Yes. Senator Hume. 
very much, Mr. President, and I will reiterate exactly what we are doing about the Great Barrier Reef because the Morrison government, I reiterate again, is deeply committed to protecting that reef. That is why the Australian and Queensland governments are now investing more than $3 billion from 2014-15 to 23-24 to implement the Reef 2050 plan. More than $2 billion of this is from the Australian government, which is an un unprecedented investment. Australia's practical action on emissions reduction goes hand in hand with our practical action on reef protection and climate adaption. And this includes efforts to improve the health and the resilience of the reef to climate change by reducing local and regional pressures and leading the way in reef adaption science through measures like $150 million of reef, reef restoration and adaption program. That's a world-leading investment pro a project to find innovative ways to, for the coral reef Order. to adapt to the impacts of climate change, an issue that I know is so dear to your heart, Senator Wish Wilson. Order. Senator Wong. Mr President, my question is to the Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Reynolds. The Leader of the House advised the House at the commencement of Christmas time that Mr Joyce would be absent from question time as he is a close contact. Minutes later, the Deputy Prime Minister showed up. Can the Minister advise why? The Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, and I thank Senator Wong for that question. I would point out that since that's been happening, I have actually been here in the chamber in question time myself, so I'll have to take that question on notice and get back to you. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Can the minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister advise whether the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia is a close contact or not? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And again, my previous answer stands is we'll have to get uh, advice on that and, and advise you back. Order, Senator. Senator Wong. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, in a week of chaos. Order, order Senator Wong. I'm going to. I'll give you the chance to recommence. I can't hear the question, and it's from both sides of the chamber. Senator Wong, you can restart the clock. Thank you. Uh, in a week of chaos from this coalition government, we've had the Nationals under Deputy Prime Minister Joyce attempt to tear up the Murray-Darling Basin plan, National Party talking points saying the science no longer supports fresh water for South Australia, and now we have confusion about who represents the Prime Minister in the House question time. All the while, three capital cities are facing COVID-19 outbreaks and facing restrictions or lockdowns, a complete rewrite of the vaccine rollout, and no plan for fit-for-purpose quarantine. What confidence can this government, Order. can Senator Australians Wong, have in this chaotic government? Expired. Order. Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I take most of that as largely as a political statement from Senator Wong. But I can tell you there is no chaos or confusion on this side of the chamber. You have a look. We have been Order. focusing on the health of Australians, Order. on the economy, on jobs, Order. on education, on, my left. Uh, on disability. So this week has been you know, the national order on my left. There is sorry, Senator Wong, Senator Polly. There are too many names to call out, Senator Wong. Sorry, Senator Watt. I meant to say on occasion. My apologies. Senator Reynolds to continue. Thank you. There is no confusion on this side about what is important for this nation. As I've said, it is all about the economy. It is about protecting Australians, keeping them safe, and keeping them healthy. Thank Senator you, Mr. President. Senator McAllister. Senator, Senator Birmingham. Mr President, can I seek leave to make a short statement in relation to Senator Wong's primary question? Leave is, leave is not granted. Order. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Special Minister for State, Senator Birmingham. At Senate estimates in May, I asked the Electoral Commissioner Mr Tom Rogers, a simple question, quote, who conducted the audit on the software used by the Australian Electoral Commission, how much did the audit cost and what was the result? The answer was, quote, if you are trying to suggest there is a problem, I don't understand why you would do that. Let me ask again, who conducted the most recent audit of the AEC election software, how much did it cost? And what was the result? The Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thank, thanks Mr. President. Um, uh, thank Senator Roberts for uh, the question. I can't quite recall whether those details were actually also taken on notice 
uh, during the estimates hearings. It, uh, it would not be a surprise uh, to, uh, to the Senate that, in terms of uh, those contract details, I don't have them precisely to hand in the chamber. Uh, so I will take them on notice here, noting they may already have been taken on notice through the estimates process. Uh, but I would also state uh, our complete confidence in the integrity and operation of the Australian Electoral Commission. Senator Roberts, a supplementary question. The Australian National Audit Office audited the results of the 2016 federal election and has not been asked back since. If the Australian National Audit Office were not asked to look at the software in the last four years, who has? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Well, we are talking about two entities that, uh, that operate with, uh, with independence uh, from government, the Australian Electoral Commission and the Australian National Audit Office. Uh, in terms of the interaction between those entities, I can take it on notice to seek information from them. Uh, but, Mr President, uh, I'm not able to, uh, to provide Senator Roberts with uh, details uh, and myself of those interactions. They're certainly not interactions directed by the government. Senator Roberts, a final supplementary question. In March and again in May this year, I asked the following question and on both occasions did not receive an answer. So I ask again. In 2019, how many physical paper ballots were compared back to the electronic data record after the initial data entry, which would be an essential part of this auditing, auditing we are assured is going on. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Well, my recollection is that the Australian Electoral Commissioner did talk through uh, some of those issues in the recent estimates hearings uh, with you, uh, Senator Roberts, and, uh, and that uh, that uh, was addressed in those estimates hearings. I know you have been exploring those issues for a period of time uh, and that some responses have been placed on notice, uh, but I also recall in relation to the comparison between paper ballots and data processing and the steps that the AEC undertake in that regard that the Commissioner did take you through um, uh, the explanations during those recent estimates hearings. I'd refer you to the Hansard in that regard. Uh, if, following review of that Hansard, you have uh, additional aspects that are unclear, uh, then of course I'm always happy to work through them with you. Senator Patterson. To President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister advise the Senate on how the Morrison government is supporting Australian businesses and business owners to get on with what they do best? so they can grow, prosper and create more jobs for Australians. The Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Patterson for the question. And Senator Patterson, you are right. That is the priority of the Morrison government, to support employers out there, to support businesses, to prosper, to grow and to create more jobs for Australians. And certainly COVID-19 has had an absolutely devastating effect uh, on businesses out there. But because of the economic policies that the Morrison government put in place, what we have seen is the economy rebound back. What we have seen is businesses utilising the policies that we have put in place to prosper, to grow. And as we know, based on the employment figures, in particular the most recent employment figures from May 2021, they are certainly creating more jobs for Australians. And Mr President, what we know in government is that businesses don't create jobs, uh, or government doesn't create jobs. Businesses do. Governments put in place the economic framework, the economic framework that businesses can utilise to prosper and grow. And certainly at this point in time, we're ahead of almost every other country in the world, Mr President. We now have in Australia more people in employment than we did prior to COVID-19. That is a good thing and it is something that we are proud of as a government. And Mr President, it is because of the policies that the government is putting in place. We have delivered record business confidence as a result of our government's economic measures. And when you look at those economic measures, Mr President, the budget's expansion of the full expensing measure has seen the strongest numbers in machinery and equipment investment in 17 years. The strongest 
the strongest numbers in machinery and equipment investment. That's because, Mr. President, what we're saying to business is, if you have the capacity to invest in yourself, we will back you every step of the way. Because we know when you invest in yourself, you grow the business and you employ more Australians. Order. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Order. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, and I just really appreciate, as a Victorian senator, hearing Senator Watt's interjections about the cost of lockdown on small business. Uh, Order. Yeah. Order on my left. Order. Sorry. We're going to restart. You can take your seat, Senator Patterson. Order. Order. Senator Watt, Senator Carr. If you don't interject, you don't get retorts like that at the start of the question, even if they're not helpful. If the bait is not laid, it is not taken. Senator, Senator Patterson, I'll recommence the clock. Thanks, Mr President. Grateful for that. Can the minister update the Senate on how the government is continuing to move bureaucratic red and green tape for Australian businesses, both big and small? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. And red and green tape, what it does is it stops businesses from taking on their first employee. Red and green tape, it stops businesses from prospering and growing. Red and green tape, it stops businesses from expanding their businesses, growing and employing more Australians. And that is why we are focused, the Morrison government is focused, on getting rid of as much unnecessary red and green tape as we can. We understand that you need to take the regulatory burden off businesses, off employers, so that they can unlock investment, grow their business and create more jobs. Mr President, one of the things that we've achieved as a government is we've made it easier for Australians to work across state borders. That is a good thing, in particular when Order. you look at tradies. Senator tradies on Watt. the Gold Coast can now go just a few kilometres down the Order. road to Tweed Heads and do the same job without paying for a different trade licence. We will look at where we can, removing the regulatory burden on businesses Order. so Senator that— Senator Cash. Senator Patterson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, can the minister outline the importance of these measures to support businesses and any risks that Australian businesses face as we continue our economic recovery. Order. Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr President. Well, on this side of the chamber, the Morrison government side of the chamber, we are focused on putting in place those policies which will ensure that businesses are able to prosper, grow, create more jobs for Australians and ensure the continued return of our economy. In terms of the biggest risk to supporting Australians, it's, of course, the imposition of higher taxes. And you heard the Minister for Finance refer to what the Labor Party promised the Australian people when they last went to the election. $387 billion in higher taxes. As we know, those opposite have never found a tax or a regulation that they haven't loved and they haven't thought to put on business or the Australian people. Well, Mr President, in on our side of the chamber, the Morrison government side of the chamber, we have it in our DNA to lower taxes because we understand it's your money and we need to give you back your money. Whether you Order. are a business or whether you are a tax-paying Australian, you need to have in your pocket Order, more Senator of what Cash. you've worked for. Time for the answer for. has expired. Yeah. Senator Hanson-Young. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to Senator Birmingham, representing the Prime Minister and the State of South Australia. Earlier today in the House of Representatives, talking points in relation to the Murray-Darling Basin were distributed by the party responsible for the government's water policy. It claims that South Australia no longer needs fresh water. Does the minister believe that science no longer requires fresh water for South Australia? Order. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Well, I've, I've not seen the talking points that Senator Hanson Young refers to, Order. but very clearly, fresh water is important to the survival of uh, all civilisations, Mr President, to, uh, to state Order. the obvious. To state the obvious. Uh, and indeed, fresh water flows are important to the health and sustainability uh, of river systems. Uh, and as Senator Hanson Young well knows, the operation of the Murray Darling Basin Plan under the Water Act 2007, introduced by the Howard government, uh, was established uh, to try to put in place sustainable diversion limits for the first time ever across the Murray Darling Basin. And it's been very successful to date 
in doing so. In doing so, the Basin Plan has managed to recover some thousands of billions of litres of water that is now held under entitlements by the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder for the more efficient and effective management of environmental assets across the basin. In doing so, consideration is given uh, particularly to matters around flow rates uh, and ensuring that in terms of those flow rates uh, there, is, uh, there is a system as well managed as can be possible, noting the significant challenges the significant challenges in a system that now is much more highly regulated Order. than it was at its, uh, in its natural state and, of course, that has many demands placed upon it, and quite, and quite reasonable demands in that sense too. Uh, that water is not only essential uh, for human consumption and for environmental sustainability, it is also essential for food production, for agricultural productivity and that these are important considerations across the basin as well. Uh, and that is why uh, our side of politics has always sought to Order. seek to ensure that we have a system Order. that is sustainable Senator and Birmingham also respects the, the needs and interests of all expired. basin. Order on my left. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Thank you. Um, a supplementary. Given that the National Party's water policy is so wacky, dangerous, anti science, how can the Prime Minister allow the National Party to remain in charge of his government's water policy? How on earth can the Prime Minister keep the National Party in charge of the water portfolio? Good question. Order. Order. Senator Ayres. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. And Mr. President, it's the policy that matters, and the policy of the government is clear in terms of its continued support of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan uh, to be implemented, to be implemented cognizant of all of the matters that have been discussed by the Murray-Darling Basin Ministerial Council over the years. Now, those, Mr. President, who pretend uh, that the settlement of the Basin Plan by then Minister Burke uh, was simply a binary, straightforward affair are ignoring the fact that there were considerations given at the time to ensuring uh, that there was uh, that water recovery, particularly in relation to the so-called upwater as it was described at the time, uh, was to be undertaken and must be undertaken in ways that are mindful of the social and economic impacts uh, of such recovery. Uh, they've always been important points. They remain important points in terms of ensuring that the basin plan is implemented in a way that is as respectful and effective for all the communities Order. who Senator rely Birmingham. upon the river system. Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. The National Party are wanting to hold Adelaide's water supply to ransom. Yeah. When will the Prime Minister stop negotiating with these water terrorists? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, uh, I refer to, to all of my previous answers in, uh, in that regard and, uh, and, and reject uh, the premise of uh, the question that Senator Hanson Young has, uh, has put there. These are and always Order. have been very serious issues. The government's commitment to ensure the Murray-Darling Basin is managed in a way consistent with the Water Act and in a way consistent with the Basin Plan is resolute. The government's respect for the importance of that and for our community, Senator Hanson Young in South Australia, is also resolute. The government has made that very clear in the last 24 hours. Now, the advocacy uh, of senators and members of parliament for their own communities is also very important and something to be respected across this place. Uh, it is the advocacy that I bring and you bring in relation uh, to South Australia, but it's the advocacy that others bring in relation to their communities as well. I acknowledge and respect that, but the policy Order. position Senator of the government Birmingham. remains Time clear. Time for the answer has expired. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. The former Deputy Prime Minister, Mr McCormack, was a member of the Cabinet Task Force created to oversee the status of women in Australia, tasked with, amongst other things, the government's response to the Foster Review and the Jenkins Inquiry. Will newly appointed Deputy Prime Minister Joyce replace Mr McCormack? Senator Birmingham. Yes. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. 
The former Deputy Prime Minister, Mr McCormack, was the Deputy Chair of the Governance Committee of Cabinet, responsible for the ministerial standards and conduct of members of the executive. Will newly appointed Deputy Prime Minister Joyce, the only member of parliament to have his own clause in the ministerial standards, replace Mr McCormack? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, I haven't seen uh, seen an update to uh, to all of the cabinet committee arrangements, uh, but I'm sure they'll be published in the ordinary way. Senator McAllister, a final supplementary question. Mm -hmm. Nationals MP Michelle Landry said earlier this week, in relation to the prospective reappointment of now Deputy Prime Minister Mr. Joyce, and I quote, "I think that if he became leader again, there would be women out there that would be unhappy with that." If Mr Joyce doesn't even have the confidence of his own colleagues, how can he have a seat at the Cabinet Task Force on the Status of Women? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Well, the, uh, the Cabinet Task Force on uh, Women's Safety and Economic Security uh, brings together uh, all of the uh, Cabinet uh, ministers uh, who are women across our government. Uh, along with uh, Senator Hume and Senator Stoker uh, in that task force. Uh, I note that that is a record number of uh, women serving in the Australian Cabinet uh, who, uh, who sit uh, as part of that task force. It is important in terms of the consideration of those matters of women's safety and women's economic security uh, that uh, the leadership of the government uh, across the coalition parties hears clearly on those issues of safety and economic security. That's what the purpose of that task force is for. Uh, it's why the Prime Minister uh, is, uh, is a member of that task force and co-chairs it with Senator Payne. Uh, it's why the Deputy yeah. Prime Minister, the Treasurer and myself as Minister for Finance are all there uh, to ensure uh, that it informs the decisions Order. right across Senator government Senator Birmingham's as it is time for the to answer do. has expired. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, Mr President. Speaking of women in the Cabinet, my question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Yeah. Can the Minister inform the Senate how the Morrison government is supporting survivors of institutional child sexual abuse by progressing immediate improvements to the National Redress Scheme? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and can I thank Senator Smith uh, for his uh, his question uh, and his ongoing interest in this very, very important issue for many Australians. Um, we know how important redress is to to survivors of institutionalised child sex abuse, and that's why I'm very pleased to have been able to release the final report of the two-year anniversary review of the scheme, yeah, yeah. as well as the government's independent uh, in, uh, interim response. The report was prepared by independent reviewer Robin Crook, uh, and it outlines um, particularly how she believes that the scheme can be improved uh, and provide a better experience for survivors. Our interim response also ensures that survivors have as much information as they possibly can when they're making that decision as to whether they wish to pursue redress. So to ensure that the scheme is operating as it's intended to uh, and in the best interests of survivors, in the, in the recent budget we provided uh, an investment of more than an additional $80 million for that purpose. We believe it is absolutely essential that we continue to listen to advocates and survivors because we want this scheme to be the best possible scheme it can be, and particularly that it's survivor-focused. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to inform the Senate as part of uh, our commitment. We have uh, announced that we will be providing advance payments of $10,000 to redress um, survivors who are older or terminally ill. It's something that we heard was very important to survivors, not just because of the financial support that it provides, but it's also an acknowledgement to say uh, that we understand what they have been, uh, been through. Uh, but we can't do this alone. Um, we also have to, in, in the design changes that have been put forward, have to work with the states and territories. Um, to date, we have got more than 65,000 sites on board, more than six and a half applications have been finalised, and more than half a billion dollars has been provided in redress to survivors of institutionalised child sex abuse. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister? outline how the government is encouraging institutions to participate in the National Redress Scheme to ensure all survivors can access redress. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. Well, the government 
absolutely committed to ensuring that each and every survivor has access to redress. And that's why this week I named another three institutions that have failed to join the redress scheme despite having applications lodged against them. These institutions are the Forest Tennis Club here in the ACT, CYMC Basketball Association in Victoria and the Devonport Community Church in Tasmania. Uh, in addition, um, I had already named uh, Kenja Communications, who continues to remain recalcitrant to joining the scheme. It is totally and utterly unacceptable that any institution fails to meet their moral obligation and sign up to the scheme so that survivors of institutionalised child sex abuse have access to redress. Um, we will continue to take as actions wherever we possibly can to try and encourage organisations to take responsibility if they have any experience or any history of working with children. Senator Smith, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise how the government will continue to improve the scheme for survivors by responding to the remaining recommendations of the review? Senator Rustin. Well, thank you. The most important thing that we think that we can continue to do is to keep hearing from advocates, from survivors or their nominees about how we can continue to progress uh, improvements to the scheme. I can assure the Senate that uh, further consideration and consultation will continue to take place on the recommendations that we need to be working with, yeah. with the states and territories, and we will provide a full response to all recommendations in early 2022. Um, but as I said, the most important thing is to continue with the survivor-focused nature of what we're doing. Most of the recommendations require the support of the states and territories, uh, and so we will continue to work with those states and territories uh, as an absolute matter of priority. It's also, though, we are committed to working with survivors and other stakeholders, uh, and our government is absolutely committed to working with survivors to ensure that this scheme is as focused as it can be on providing them with the redress that they yeah. so justly deserve. Order, Senator Rustin. Senator Stirl. Thanks, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Reynolds. Early this year, at a Senate Select Committee on Job Security discussing foreign flagged vessels, National Senator Canavan identified, and I quote, we have just got to step in and create the circumstances to bring shipping back to Australian flagged vessels. Why is the Morrison government promoting the use of foreign flagged coastal ships, putting at risk the sovereignty of Australia's supply chain, risking jobs and devastating the ability of the inland rail project to attract the required private investment to make it work? The Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And I can confirm that on the 21st of September 2020, the department did release a discussion paper proposing changes to the coastal trading framework for cargo vessels. Uh, the proposed changes are based on stakeholder feedback. The department received 44 submissions, including from shipping companies, maritime industry, unions, and onshore businesses. Nothing in the paper is yet final. The department will continue to work collaboratively to find an outcome that all parties can accept. Uh, under the proposed reform, protections for Australian vessels will be maintained and foreign vessels will continue to need licences. Opening the coast, a strategic fleet or high-cost subsidies will not be considered. The options suggest in the discussion paper are focused on achieving administrative efficiencies within the current system. On the 10th of, July, oh, 10th of June oh, my apologies, 2021, the Special Recreational Vessels Amendment Act uh, 2021 received royal assent. This extends the super yachts legislation Order. by a further two years and allows additional time to develop a more permanent regulatory solution. Senator Stirl, a supplementary question. Yes, thanks, Mr President. Um, has the minister explained to the mayors of Albury, Parks, Narrabri and the Scenic Rim uh, many of whom are visiting Canberra at the moment, that the expected jobs and investment coming to their regions from the Inland Rail project is being put in jeopardy by the Morrison government's promotion of foreign flagged coastal ships. Have you done that, Minister? Senator Reynolds. Hmm. Um, uh, Senator Searle, I'm not sure that you actually heard the answer 
to, my, to the first question, so I might just repeat that because it does actually answer your question. So again, can I just say that the, we did release the discussion paper uh, for the proposed changes to coastal trading framework for cargo vessels. And again, nothing in the paper is final, and the department order. will continue Senator, to work. Senator Reynolds, I have Senator Stirl on a point of order. Mr. President, my point of order is relevance. There is no, the minister is going nowhere near the question I asked about inland rail. Um, I would urge you to bring it back the, to the question. I'm, the supplementary question referred to the mayors of certain towns in New South Wales and investment in an inland rail project. Uh, that's the part of the question I heard. I'm listening carefully to the minister's answer. I'm not willing to say it's not directly relevant now because the minister is talking about um, the project from my understanding of the answer. Um, I'll let the minister continue, but I will, I'll let you remind her of that part of the question. Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr President. And I'm certain when I, I heard the question, uh, there was uh, what I found not to be relevant, as, as you did in terms of rail, but Senator Stirl did also talk about uh, maritime shipping, he which did. is what uh, I am he now addressing. Quite right. he did. Yes, sir. He did. So, as I had said, under any proposed reform, protections for Australian vessels will be maintained and foreign vessels will continue to need licences. Opening the coast, a strategic fleet or high. Well, Senator, I'll take the interjection, Order. Senator Stirl. You obviously didn't Order. hear the first, you know, the first time I went through, through this for you. The options suggested in the discussion paper are focused on achieving administrative efficiencies within the current system. Order, Senator Reynolds. Uh, Senator Stirl, a final supplementary question. Oh, I do. Thank you, Mr President. We'll have another crack, shall we, Minister? Why was de former Deputy Prime Minister McCormack pursuing foreign flag coastal ships? And what is the position of the current Deputy Prime Minister, Joyce? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, Mr President, I can go through a third time uh, what we are doing on this policy for the benefit of Senator Stirl, but I think it was quite clear the government's position on this, and the government's position has not changed. Senator Scar. Mr. Order. Senator the, Scar the back is, on his feet. is asking the next question. My question is to the Minister for Sport, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister please advise the Senate? what the current status is of South East Queensland's bid for the 2032 Olympics and Paralympics. The Minister for Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank, thank you, Mr President, and thank uh, Senator Scar for the question, Mr President. South East Queensland's exciting bid for the 2032 Olympics and Paralympics has received the bell for the final lap, and the finishing line is very much in sight, Mr President. And Olympics has the potential to be a game changer for Queensland and the government remains committed to supporting Queensland's candidature. Bringing the Games to Australia in 2032 would provide a unique opportunity to motivate and inspire all Australians to get engaged and active in sport. The Australian government, the Queensland government, the Council of Mayors for South East Queensland and the Australian Olympic Committee have worked very cooperatively in developing a comprehensive bid submission to the IOC's Future Host Fund uh, Commission. This included a virtual tour of South East Queensland earlier last month. I'm thrilled to say that on the 10th of June, uh, Mr President, the International Olympic Co Committee I, uh, Executive Board agreed to propose Brisbane as the host for the 2032 Games to the IOC membership. This is the final stage of candidature but it does not mean a Brisbane, that Brisbane has secured the, uh, secured the 2032 Games, Mr President. On the 20th and the 21st of July at the 138th IOC session held in Tokyo, IOC members will receive a final presentation on the proposed bid for the 2032 Games. Members will then vote on whether Brisbane is the host for the 2032 Games. Senator Scar, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. How will the 2032 Games benefit South East Queensland and Australia? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, of course, the Olympics and Paralympics are an exciting major sporting event displaying the world's best athletes. They are, they are also, Mr. President, um, major social and economic benefits. An assessment by KPMG commissioned by the Queensland Government shows that the 2032 Games will deliver a total benefit of $8.1 billion 
for the Queensland for Queensland and $17.61 billion for Australia. The report found the 2032 Games will create 91,600 full-time equivalent job years for Queensland and 122,900 job years nationally. Mr. President. The report notes significant quantifiable social benefits derived from the 2032 Games, including health community benefits. Order, and Senator Colbeck. Senator Scar, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. How is the Morrison Joyce government supporting the 2032 Games bid? Senator Colbeck. Th th thank you, Mr. President. The Morrison Joyce government is strongly supporting the 2032 Games bid, Mr. President. A national partnership agreement between the Commonwealth and the Queensland government has been signed, which provides up to $10 million to support the bid process, Mr. President. As part of the bid process, the Commonwealth has provided a number of guarantees in areas such as security, immigration and taxation that are vital Mr. President, to the successful operation of such a major international event. And the Prime Minister has committed to funding required for crucial Games infrastructure, with funding to be provided on a 50-50 basis Mr. President, with the Queensland Government. These infrastructure investments will, of course, cater for the 32 bid uh, for the Games. But it's the long-term use of these facilities for local communities, Mr. President, and sporting organisations that is at the forefront of our planning. Order, Senator Colbeck. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that further questions yeah. be placed on notice. Senators, could I make a brief statement before the at the end of conclusion of question time? The Speaker will also be making a similar statement to the House at the conclusion of their question time. As senators will be aware, the Australian Human Rights Commission is conducting an independent review into Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces led by the Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins. The review is open to all people who currently work or have previously worked in parliamentary workplaces around Australia. The review is in its form information gathering phase and it is critical that the review is informed by a wide range of perspectives and experiences of workplace culture, whether positive or negative. Everyone is encouraged to participate no matter what your role is. Members and senators should encourage their staff to participate. Written submissions close on the 31st of July. Interviews are being conducted over the next five weeks, including in Canberra during the first sitting week in August. Correspondence has been sent to all MPs and senators on how to participate and all current staff through the Department of Finance and other parliamentary departments. If you'd like any further information or have any questions concerning this review, further information is available via the Australian Human Rights Commission and at their website at humanrights.gov.au. Thanks, Senators. Senator Reynolds. Thank you. Uh, I seek leave to answer a question I took on notice from Senator Wong during question time. Leave. Don't. Senator, Re yep. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, during question time, I took on notice a question from Senator Wong um, about the Deputy Prime Minister, and I now have a statement that was delivered by the Deputy Prime Minister during question time. And it reads uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And with indulgence, shortly before question time, I was alerted that they may, I may have been in contact with a person who was a close contact with a case. I immediately sought further information and advice from Deputy Chief Medical Officer Professor Michael Kidd. As I am not a close contact, I am now able to attend the chamber. Thank you, Thank you yep. Senator Reynolds. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Keneally. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Colbeck to the questions asked by Senator Gallagher and me. Well, as we stand here today, we have three states facing COVID outbreaks, community transmission of COVID. Just weeks ago, we had no community transmission of COVID in Australia. That was the good news supplied just weeks ago. But here today, as a result of outbreaks from hotel quarantine, hotel quarantine outbreaks are now leading to potential lockdowns in New South Wales, significant restrictions in place as we stand here in the Senate today. Three cases of community transmission reported this morning in Queensland and, of course, the uh, outbreak that we saw earlier in Victoria. 
Whose responsibility is quarantine? Well, under the Constitution, it is the federal government, the Morrison government. And yet here we are some 16 months into this pandemic, and we still do not have fit for purpose quarantine facilities in Australia. It is a shame. In New South Wales, we have 40 cases of community transmission. This is a highly contagious COVID variant. Uh, we have a significant, significant challenges going on in the people in New South Wales right now. From an airport driver who was unvaccinated. Whose responsibility is vaccination supply? The federal government, the Morrison government. So these COVID outbreaks sit squarely at the feet of the Commonwealth government, the Morrison government, failing to supply vaccines, failing to deliver fit for purpose quarantine. And let us remember, what the Morrison government promised as their targets. They promised that all Australians would be fully vaccinated by October. That won't happen. They promised that 4 million Australians would be vaccinated by the end of March. That did not happen. They promised that all of 1A category would be vaccinated by Easter. That did not happen. And who is in 1A? Frontline healthcare workers border and quarantine workers, people living and working in aged care and disability settings. They have not been vaccinated yet. And they promised, the Morrison government promised, that six million Australians would be vaccinated by the 10th of May. That did not happen. What has happened instead? We have now no targets. <laughs> No promises. We have horizons. We have horizons. And we don't just have one horizon. Oh, no, 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 no. The document that the Minister for Aged Care and the Minister representing the Minister for Health tried to keep secret, but finally had to table. It has three horizons for each state and territory. I know, Senator Sheldon's chuckling because it is laughable, isn't it? Three horizons for each state and territory and three horizons for the national government. 27 horizons. Well, horizon, a horizon by definition is a thing you never meet. It's a thing you never get to. It's always out there ahead of you. We don't just have one horizon. We have 27 horizons in this uh, Morrison government supposed vaccine strategy, and we are not going to meet any of them because you don't meet a horizon. You never get to it. I mean, come on. This COVID vaccination allocation horizons. What did we hear from the minister today? We heard, we heard that only some 11,000 uh, workers in aged care in New South Wales have been fully vaccinated. That's about 10% of the aged care workers' population in New South Wales. 10%! We have a COVID outbreak going on in Sydney. And we have aged care workers, some 90% of them in New South Wales, not vaccinated. The Morrison government had two jobs. Fit for purpose quarantine, roll out a vaccine. They are failing at both and they are leaving Australians behind. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, well, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, I think Australians, what Australians expect from their government uh, during a global pandemic is that they keep them alive. That is what we are doing. That is what we are trying to do. That is what we are trying to make sure that Australians are kept safe and alive. That's what all our efforts are, are focused on. That's why we went through all the costs last year of closing our international borders of, for a time, shutting down our economy. It was to keep Australians alive. And because the opposition has nothing to say on that matter, they are going for these, all these other issues. But it is important to come back to the fact that this year, this year, not a single Australian who here in Australia has died from coronavirus. Not a single person. Not a single person. Overseas, overseas, more than 2 million people have died this year. 
from coronavirus. More than two million people, the equivalent of the whole town of Brisbane, has unfortunately died from this global pandemic. It is a terrible, shocking and tragic thing that has happened to the world. But here in this country, with the cooperation of Australians, with the working together with state governments, Australians have been largely kept alive. We are very, very lucky. Now, the opposition would like to compare us to sort of Mars or something, where there's no risk. They'd like us to be like an outer planet where there's no coronavirus and no absolute risk at all. Well, that world doesn't exist here. It doesn't. We have to accept risk. We have to get Australians back home, which the opposition was calling for last year. They wanted more to come home. We have to get them home. And when they come home from countries that have lots of coronavirus, there is risks. There is risks. Now, yes, there has been outbreaks from hotel quarantine, but that is to be expected in a risky environment. More than 99 per cent of people that have gone through hotel quarantine have not led to any community transmission because it's worked pretty well. It's worked pretty well. It's not perfect. Not perfect. It's no system is perfect. And even if everybody was vaccinated, the vaccines, guess what? The vaccines is not perfect. You can still contract, you can still transmit uh, the coronavirus with the vaccine as well. So we want to make sure we get Australia vaccinated as fast as possible, but we were also right to be cautious with our vaccine rollout, as we have seen with the problems experienced by AstraZeneca. Because the opposition have not been mature about this issue. At every point, they have operated like a panicked child with every uh, bad news story that has come about. At the start of the year, they had the leader of the opposition, Anthony Albanese, wanting just to vaccinate people as soon as possible, even before our own health authorities had gone through the proper assessments of the vaccines. If we'd adopted those appro that approach, we probably would have ended up with more Australians dying from the AstraZeneca vaccine than we have. Two Australians have died linked to the AstraZeneca vaccine. More have died in Australia this year from the vaccine rollout than have from coronavirus spread. That's a tragic thing. Uh, that, again, the vaccine has risks. Life has risks. And we were right and proper to make sure we assess those risks proportionally to the risks that we faced here from coronavirus and be cautious about that rollout. When there were issues with AstraZeneca first exposed a few months ago, I called for a pause so we'd look at it and hear it. Then I was pilloried by the opposition. They'd come in to Senate estimates and say what a crazy person that Senator Canavan is. Well, now we know there are real risks. There are real risks and we were right to look very closely at those risks. But again, the opposition, acting like a child, jumps up and down, panics, runs into the corner, uh, rather than dealing with the facts of life when the facts of life is that there are risks. Our job as a sensible, mature adult government is to manage those risks as reasonably as we can to get them as lowest as we can. But they'll never disappear. They will never disappear. And we have to be upfront with the Australian people about the risks we face in a world where there is a global pandemic, but on every score, on every measure. We have kept Australians safe. We have made sure that most Australians, many more Australians that are alive today uh, uh, than, than other countries have experienced over the past year. And that is a great success. Now, I'm confident with the cooperation we have seen from Australians over the last year, we will receive the same type of cooperation as we do get more vaccine doses, as the Pfizer doses come in and Moderna later this year. We will get those vaccination rates. We will get out of this. We will rebuild our country. We will come out of this safer and stronger than we were before. But we'll only do that if we stop panicking, stop being the panic merchants that the opposition constantly Thank do you, when Senator they enter Canavan, this debate. Your time has expired. Senator Ayres. Last contribution says so much about what's wrong with the Morrison government. You've got a government that is run by an advertising executive and uh, Senator Canavan, who represents the most reasonable sounding of the maddest of the coalition backbench, is the voice in the back of their head. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's not a race, he says. Don't worry about it. Vaccines could be dangerous. But that's what's wrong with this government. As we speak today, the situation, far from being a panic, the situation in New South Wales appears to be moving quickly and the government in New South Wales is working its way through its response. There are multiple locations, and it's fair to say 
that New South Wales is in a more perilous position than it has been for many, many months. Indeed, the New South Wales Parliament appears to have had a spread inside its own building. And I want to commend two MPs in that place who have displayed remarkable leadership. Uh, firstly, the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Minns, immediately upon learning about this, put the interests of the state before his own political interests and has postponed his budget reply speech. Now, Mr Minns has recently taken over the leadership of the New South Wales Labor Party and could reasonably have been expected that that opportunity to speak to the people of New South Wales would have been a significant milestone for him. But without question, he put the interests of people first before his own political interests. I also want to commend the Minister for Agriculture in New South Wales, Mr Marshall, uh, who, uh, who has uh, contracted the coronavirus himself and issued a very sensible uh, statement, and I wish him well, an important part of the process when political leaders contract the disease. But I tell you what, while I don't want to preempt any of the decisions of the New South Wales government, and they will have to make some difficult decisions in the days ahead, the Premier of New South Wales has been very clear this week about the problem. She has pointed the finger directly at the Morrison government. Now, Senator Canavan might think that the bungled vaccine rollout is not a problem, but Ms Berejiklian knows that the fact that just over 3 per cent of New South Wales residents are vaccinated, just over 3 per cent, that, that just over 3 per cent are fully vaccinated, that, that their levels of supply are nowhere near the level of demand that is required and that New South Wales is a global laggard, just like the rest of Australia, because Mr Morrison couldn't run a bath. He can't manage his way through this problem. When the country had the opportunity to seize this issue and actually approach a public health issue with the seriousness it deserved, he's entirely bungled the vaccine rollout. It couldn't be in a worse position than Mr Morrison's put Australia in. We are 100th in the queue. Other countries overseas with similar health systems, and even the Americans whose health system is in a very poor state, are in the high 30s and mid 40s in terms of the amount of their populations. And guess what? They'll be opening up. There'll be opportunities for their citizens. There'll be opportunities for their businesses because they've got the vaccine rollout right and Mr Morrison has bungled it for every Australian. And then we turn to hotel quarantine. Absolutely criticised by anybody who knows anything about quarantine. What have we had? Dozens of outbreaks from hotel quarantine. 15 months, 15 months to prepare for Mr Morrison to build purpose-built quarantine facilities across Australia. And what has Mr Morrison achieved? Precisely nothing precisely nothing. He has squandered the opportunity to fix vaccines, to fix quarantine, and he has left Australia in a vulnerable place where we are less safe, where growth will be held back and Australia will be held back because of his failures, his incapacity to put the national interest ahead of his own narrow political interest. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I mean, like, seriously, I don't know where you guys live, because it's certainly not in Australia with the rest of us. And I mean, it's just extraordinary, this constant talking down that we see of Australia's efforts around the entire COVID pandemic. I mean, we know that you don't understand the basic economics of the pandemic and all the, the programs we put in place to ensure Australians were able to stay connected to their employers. We've now got less unemployment than we had pre-pandemic. And that was all at a time when over here these naysayers were all, oh, don't end job keeper, the economy's going to fall off a cliff. Guess what? Keeps getting better. And that's because of the leadership of the Morrison government with Treasurer Josh Frydenberg. Now, when we do come to the vaccine rollout, 
The 2020 hindsight vision displayed by those opposite is breathtaking. I mean, I am just so impressed at how you are all apparently lounge chair, uh, armchair epidemiologists with, who are experts and knew clearly before the actual experts what was going to happen with regards to the vaccines. In fact, last March, who would have thought we'd have had a vaccine by this stage? This has been the most incredible rollout and uh, efforts by science and research to ensure that we can move towards a vaccine at all. We have four vaccines in Australia lined up. And by the time we get to October, there will be two million doses per week of the Pfizer. Now, I have my first Pfizer jab in New South Wales because Gladys Berejiklian continues to demonstrate a gold standard in every single way. And I am not in the over 50 uh, category. I'd like that on the record. Maybe I should say it again, because I qualified for the Pfizer. And the Pfizer was for 40 to 49. You don't feel as smug about it anymore now it goes up to 59. But uh, back then in New South Wales, the 40 to 49 year olds were entitled to uh, qualify for the Pfizer, of which I've had the first jab and I'm looking forward to my second jab next week. But that would just make me one of 140,000 Australians who have received a dose of the vaccine, because that's how many received it yesterday. And if today we see another 140,000 Australians receive a dose of vaccine, that will put us at 7 million doses of vaccine that have been delivered. Now, we hear over there so much misinformation, and it is absolutely uh, so dangerous to be continuing to propagate these lies and deceit to the Australian people. It is creating more fear and uncertainty, and you should be ashamed. The reality is the vaccine's not available to under 16. So when we talk about percentage of the population, let's remove the under 16s, shall we? And most states are only making it available to over 50s. So we need to remove everyone from 16 to 50, except you know, New South Wales and I think a couple of other places are allowing 40. But you know, South Australia, have a nice glass of water with it after you've had your vaccine. Not that anyone drinks water from South Australian taps, and I can say that as an old Adelaide girl. But uh, you, know, you have your vaccine, seven million doses. In the last seven days, we've had nearly 800,000 doses given. And like every other country in the world, vaccine rollouts have, have been you know, a, a growth period. They, they're a bit slow when they start out, but they pick up pace exponentially. In fact, to go between 4 million and 5 million doses, it took just nine days. And to go from 5 million to 6 million doses, it took 10 days, but that did include a public holiday. So, you know, maybe we can look at nine being the, the standard for the last two weeks for each million dose. But we don't want to talk about actual figures in reality, because that would mean those opposite need to acknowledge and accept that two thirds of Australians, for those of you not good at maths, because we know, you know what happens any time you guys get near the budget, two thirds, 66.6% of all Australians over 70 are protected. Almost half, and in fact by today it looks like it will be half, of all Australians over 50 will be protected. Now we also hear scare campaigns, they haven't had their second dose. 80% uh, protection at single dose. Stop your smear and your disinformation campaign you, and stop Senator scaring Hughes, Australians. Your time has expired. Senator Sheldon. Good, thanks very much, uh, Acting Deputy, uh, De uh, Deputy President. Well, isn't this really interesting? You know, both Senator Canavan and Senator Hughes have the Monty Python defence. Always look on the bright side of life. Well, the reality of it is, and that is that the bright side of life is seeing the Australian community economically being crucified because the government has not got its act together. We've seen the lockdowns due to the quarantine failures in New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland. That's where responsibility should be taken for this government to say we're going to rectify. They should be coming in here to say how we're going to fix these problems, not how we're going to turn around and obfuscate, turn around and avoid taking responsibility for what's been going on 
in this, in this country right, right now. Now, of course, you know, unless you've been living under a rock, everyone in Australia knows that the Morrison government has botched the vaccine rollout. We have one of the slowest vaccine rollouts of any developed country in the world. And of course, the Prime Minister says it's not a race because it's a race we are losing because of his lack of, des of uh, desire to make sure we get the right outcomes. He seems he can take time off sightseeing in Cornwell, enjoying the benefits of a country which has actually vaccinated their citizens. But then the story is very different when it comes to residents in my state of New South Wales. What Australians don't know is just how badly the Morrison and Berejiklian government have botched hotel quarantine in New South Wales. While the state government has introduced a hotel quarantine process for international arrivals, I have been informed by today by multiple whistleblowers working in the airport quarantine system that the quarantine process for crew from international passengers and freight is a sham. It's a complete and utter sham. This is what I have been told directly by three different whistleblowers working in this process. That buses which are used to transport international rivals to hotel quarantine are cleaned comprehensively by cleaners in full PPE and between every single trip. A tick for that. That is best practice. The Australian Defence Force have been brought in to load luggage into these buses in a COVID-safe manner. <coughs> Actually, a tick for that. That's best practice as well. But for international crew on passenger or freight flights, none of these systems are in place. None. The vehicles used to transport crew from the airport to the hotel are not cleaned. They are not cleaned between trips. In actual fact, you can go out to the airport, Sydney Airport, and see there's a cone between the passenger buses and the international flight crew buses. One gets cleaned, the other doesn't. And until Friday last week, they also weren't wearing masks that were uh, those same people moving international crews. So if a crew member with COVID sits in one of these minivans, then every other crew member who sits in that vehicle for the rest of the day, including the driver, even for even days later, is stepping into a viral bomb. And the Australian Defence Force isn't used to load bags into these vehicles. The drivers are forced to do it themselves, without PPE, except maybe a face mask, only since last Friday. And as one of these drivers who are driving vehicles that are not cleaned, who have to touch all the luggage themselves, who has set up the cluster which is now spreading the, like wildfire across Sydney. And of course, it isn't the first time. The Northern Beaches cluster, just before Christmas, was also started by one of those drivers who have not got the processes in place. So this government is failing after failing after failing to protect economically New South Wales and the rest of this country. Now, has the federal government allowed two entirely different COVID safety procedures to be put in place at Sydney Airport? One for you know, big buses, maybe that's why they thought it was necessary, and, you know, but none for any other buses, but even they were still transporting international crew around and exposing Australian crews, the Australian community, because those same people, those drivers, once infected, as we've seen in the New South Wales cluster, that people are infected right across the community. Now, the quarantine and transport hub at Sydney Airport needs to be fixed. It needs to be rectified. And we need to make sure that we turn around and have this whole this government is accountable for what it's doing about wrecking our economy, exposing our people to an epidemic. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion moved by Senator Keneally to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Hanson, yeah? Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of uh, the question and answer um, uh, put forward by my colleague, uh, Senator Wish Wilson, uh, earlier today, and that is in relation to the great threat that the Great Barrier Reef is under. Sorry, due to Senator Hanson Young, who was the question to? Uh, it was to uh, the Senator the Hume. Senator Hume representing the Environment Thank you. Minister. Um, 
It was in relation to a question uh, to the Environment Minister uh, through Senator Hume in relation to the uh, great threat to the Great Barrier Reef because of climate change. The UN body responsible for world heritage listing and managing and overseeing world heritage sites has been uh, very concerned with the health of the Great Barrier Reef. And earlier this week, declared that the Great Barrier Reef is under such stress, uh, such danger uh, from uh, climate change that they want to list it as such. Now, this is one of the world's greatest reefs, one of the world's most precious environmental places, one of Australia's most precious spots. It is what is iconic around the world in relation to Australia. It is what the rest of the world thinks of when they think of the land down under. And it is under threat because of climate change and the mismanagement of our environment. Nemo is under threat because of Mr Barnaby Joyce, his obsession with coal and the fossil fuel industry, and of course, the Prime Minister Scott Morrison. In fact, Prime Minister Scott Morrison and Barnaby Joyce, as the Deputy Prime Minister, are killing Nemo on the Great Barrier Reef. That's what's going on here. And the world is watching, and they are horrified. And they know that Australia has understood that this threat has been there for a long time. But of course, when the UN uh, made this uh, declaration earlier this week. We heard from the, the government here and the Environment Minister herself, uh, Susan Lay, that they were blindsided. Well, what absolute rubbish. If you are blindsided, despite all of the warnings from the scientists, despite all of the work that's been going on, despite all of the warning signs, all of the conversations, all of the money that has been spent by this government, then you're either incompetent or you're trying to pull the wool over the eyes of not just the Australian people but the rest of the world. Now, Australia should be ashamed that our government has let the Great Barrier Reef deteriorate to this level, bleaching event after bleaching event. And still, on the international stage, we have Australia's Prime Minister arguing for less action on climate change. We have our Resources Minister promoting selling more fossil fuels overseas. We have ministers in this place pretending that the science of climate change can just be ignored. No one at UNESCO and not many Australians were shocked or blindsided by the decision and the announcement that the Great Barrier Reef is under great threat from climate change. Year eight students at, at, in South Australia know that the climate is killing our reef. Scientists have been warning the Australian government that this would happen. In this very place, the Greens have been warning the government that we needed to act faster. It is just absolute rubbish for the minister to suggest that she was blindsided. Willfully blind. She was either willfully blind or she's incompetent. Make no mistake, as we head to the election either at the end of this year or into next year, Australians will remember that this is the government that has killed Nemo, that has funnelled more money to the fossil fuel industry and that is overseeing the death of the Great Barrier Reef. And while the rest of the world is crying out for more ambition to tackle climate change and to reduce pollution, we have our Deputy Prime Minister side by side with the Prime Minister of Australia taking money from fossil fuel companies and wanting to pollute more, more, more. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Hanson Young to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. So we'll now move.